a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are again tonight expressing to Thee, the great Almighty, how thankful we are to be assembled here together, Amen. alive and able to worship Thee tonight. And we've come together for that purpose, to set together in heavenly places as brothers and sisters, citizens of the kingdom of God, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit upon us that He might reveal to us what we should do, the program of our life. We want to walk according to His will. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that you will start from the foundation and just cleanse us, Lord, and make us new creatures that we might be fit for thy service. Amen. Knowing this is totally impossible for us, Father, for no more could we cleanse ourselves and a leopard could lick his spots clean. He only brightens it by trying to make his own effort. But there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. That's what cleanses the leper spots. I pray thee, Heavenly Father, to grant tonight that each one of us can plunge beneath there, leaving all of our doubts behind, all the doubts of God's love and promise for us in this hours. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing this as we sit down instead of saying only believe. Let's just raise our hands and sing, Now I believe. Everyone now. Now I believe. appropriate after asking God, then tell him, now I believe, after asking him. This has been a real hard day for me. I'm, there's so many things to do and maybe 75 interviews waiting and you just can't get to them all, that's all. It's just totally impossible. I had four calls today to fly out of town, one to Beaumont, Texas, and one to Houston and one to uh, Camelsville, Kentucky, and one to Little Rock, Arkansas, emergency sick. And just before leaving, they uh, come in a call for me to fly from here uh, Sunday night as soon as service is over to be way somewhere close to the West Coast to preach a funeral. And I, you just can't get to all, and that's just why I come in here. The ones that know we're here, what about at home in the office? You see, And them people that's nice people, and they're Christians, many of them. And they, but you just can't be everywhere at once, so you just try to do the best you can while you're there. It does make you nervous, but you know what? It, it takes nervous people sometimes to get somewhere. <laughs> you know, you get keyed up into a spot. Did you know that most always that people under inspiration are considered uh, neurotics? <laughs> that is right. Just think of which one of the prophets wasn't considered a neurotic. That's right. <laughs> Even Jesus, they said, you're a man. Yeah. It means crazy. See? And Paul said in the way that's called crazy, that's the way I worship God. Amen. Heresy. Crazy. And you take poets for the inspiration they climb into a place where just ordinarily people doesn't get there. I think of, of Stephen Foster who gave America its famous folk songs. Now, I think he had it in his mind, but not in his heart. And I used to live just across the river from old Kentucky home. You know, after writing that famous folk song, he would um, go out and get on a drum. And he just couldn't stand it. And finally, uh, coming out from under that inspiration, one day he called a servant and got a razor and committed suicide. So you, you're, when you're up there, everything's fine. And when you're down here, it's, it's in between. 
when you're coming out from under, you ought to ask the manager and some of them were trying to walk you around at night after one of those lines of discernment. Oh my, you don't know where everything's a vision or what's taking place. And it's, it's, see, everything everything you look at, so you don't know where it's really a vision or what it is. You just And you're the one that's doing that. See, you're, you're the very one that's pulling that. I was explaining it to the pastor today. It's like a little boy trying to look through a hole in a wall to see a circus. He pulls up by his hands and looks through and can maybe see like a giraffe or a camel and drop back down and say, what else did you see? Well, it almost kills him to go up again to see it. But then after a while, if someone could come around and pick him up, raise him up and say, here's the way it goes. The, the garland starts here and it rings just the way and he comes out over here, sets him down like it doesn't bother. That's the way that God was in Christ. Now, the woman had touched his garment. Just a little woman in the time of menopause, she was having a blood issue, and she couldn't, the doctors couldn't stop it, and she touched his garment, and he turned around and said, Who touched me? Virtue went from me. See, that was the woman using God's gift. She pulled God through him. That was the woman doing that. She took the privilege of using God's gift. But when Lazarus died, he said he did nothing until the Father showed him. And after he went away for a while and, and they sent for him to come pray for Lazarus, he did not go. He went to another place. And then they sent again and he didn't go and put it off, went to another place. And finally he turned and said to his disciples, Lazarus sleepeth. Well, they said he does well. Then he talked in their language, he's dead. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. See, the father done told him how long it would be because he said he didn't know until the father showed him. And then how long it would be and what would take place and for him to go back. He's listening, but I'd go wake him. And when he got down to the grave of Lazarus, he prayed. He said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast already heard, but I say this for those who are standing by. He knew what was going to do. And then he called Lazarus from the grave. There wasn't one thing said about virtue going from him. That was God using his gift. And the other was the woman using God's gift. Now, you can't manufacture a vision. It has to come from God. So your faith is what does it. Faith is the only thing that God will recognize in the being is faith in his promised word. And you do that yourself. It's your faith that does that. But then when a vision comes, sometimes a vision that God would give about going somewhere, why, sometimes it lasts for hours. It never does bother me. But it's these kind that hurts. And then you come back and you wonder where you're at. And I think... Uh, William Kepper, I believe was his name, wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood. I stood by his grave not long ago in London. I just had to cry a little because I felt sorry for the man. He was a poet. And he, when he went up in the inspiration and wrote them songs, well, when he come out of that, he, he tried to, he got a, a driver and tried to find the river to commit suicide. And it's so foggy they couldn't even find it. See, he was, he was lost. He was, come from inspiration back down to earth again. What does it all mean, friend? That truly there is a land beyond the river. It's that we climb up to see it. So we know it's going to be someday that we're going to go to that land. That's our great hope. Now, uh, tonight, I never told my son to give out prayer cards, but each night the Lord's been healing the sick from the audience. And uh, just calling to them, the ones that has faith, listen close to what he says now, see, and when he, when he speaks. But I think tomorrow night, now that we will change the uh, order of the meeting, and how many would like to just be prayed for, just, just be prayed for the sick? Well, all right. I'll send Billy just a little early, if it's all right with our beloved pastor, and we will Give out all of you a prayer card that wants it, and then we'll just call the people up and come by and pray for them. I couldn't take everyone in one of those lines of discernment. It, I'd be taking me out and be praying for me. And if, you think if one woman touched his garment and he was the divine Son of God, if one woman touched his garment and it made him feel weak, what would it do to me, a sinner saved by his grace? You'd never get over one, or maybe that, if he hadn't said, These things that I do shall you do also, more than this shall you do. For, see, he says King James has greater, but the right word is more, if you look at that. More, because no one could do greater than that. He raised the dead and stopped nature. He'd done everything. So the only thing, the church, all God was in one man there. But that big pillar of fire that led Israel became flesh and dwelt among us. But when he was crucified, 
rose again and ascended to God, on the day of Pentecost, he came back in the form of this pillar of fire and separated himself, tongues of fire, set up on each of them, God dividing himself among his church, because that was his wife. And a husband and wife is one together. God and the church is one together. God in you. That was God above us, God with us, God in us. Same God all the time. This three manifestations, attributes, or offices, or whatever you want to call it, like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's the same God all the time, see? And now, that was God above us. Could not be touched. Even the mountain would be touched where he was on. It must be thrust through with the dark. Because sin had not had an offering yet. But then God come and was manifested among us. We handled him with our hands. He said, right. God. Right. First Timothy the three sixteen, with the out controversy, great is the mystery of God is for God was manifested in the flesh, seen of angels, and believed on in the world, received up in the glory. See? See? Now that was God with us. God over us. God with us. Now God in us. All that God was, he poured into Christ. All that Christ was, he poured into the church. At that day, you'll know that I'm in the Father, the Father in me, I in you, and you in me. So it's been God all along. You see, the same works, the church is ordained to carry on his work with the same spirit. You couldn't carry on the same work without the same spirit. So the same spirit carries on the work. So now, you're so nice to talk to. I, I get overtime every night. And uh, I, I don't like to do that, but... I am thinking with all my heart that we're at the end time. I, I, don't, I don't say that just because it's a common saying among the people. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart and with the sincerity of my heart. That's the reason I don't try to build big things, do great big things and build big spires. And I, I believe Christ is coming. I, 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 everything, let's, let's do it right now because there may not be no tomorrow. Let's get it done today if we can. Everything that we can do. Therefore, I never did permit, or don't think the Holy Spirit would want me to have great big things where to have great big... Now, that's all right for those who to do that. I don't condemn them. That's fine. But to have, uh, like telecast that takes the whole nation in, have to beg people for money, and to do that, they have to do it because they have to pay for it. Radio broadcast, that's, that's all right. That's fine. But that wasn't for me. Uh, I just like, well, I'd worry myself to death over that. And I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't. I started to take up an offering one time in my life. I guess you heard about it. I, I started to take an offering. I, we just got such a fix I almost had to have. I, I had some debts and I'd work and I'd tuck my hat and pour out my paycheck and we just couldn't make it. And I never did take an offering at the tabernacle. I pastored 17 years without a penny. And I said to the wife, I said, we, we just got to. I'm going over to take an offering. She said, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> Goes over and sits down. That night I, after the love, I said, I, I kind of hate to say this. I said, I've been with you a long time. I, I never did ask you for anything. I said, but I, I got some bills that got to me to need about six dollars and I said I, I just haven't got I just haven't got it and it's due and I said Saturday and I, I just haven't got it to pay and I said if you all any of you have about a dime I said uh, if you'd help a little on I'd appreciate it and, and everybody started to cry there's no woman sitting down there and a deacon got up and we didn't even have a collection plate and I, I said you get my hat and I went and got my hat and I looked down there, and the little sister's always praying for me. She had a, one of these old-fashioned southern mother that had one of these little uh, little pocketbooks that snaps at the door. She unsnapped at me. Oh, my. <laughs> I looked at that. I couldn't have spent that for nothing. I said, I, I was just teasing. I wanted to see what she was going to say. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> I couldn't do it. That's close as I ever come taking off. <laughs> There's an old man he's come out of my house. He, uh, he, I think he belonged to the house of David or something. He had a long beard and hair. He gave me an old bicycle. It, it was backslidden. But, uh, I, not backslidden, but it was wore out. It didn't probably serve its duty, all right. But it was, uh, so I, I went out to the 10 cent store and got me two cans of paint for 20 cents, and I painted it and sold it for $6. So I didn't have to get off it. And so that's the closest I come on. I, I, See, what if I'd be here with all that great obligation 
And the Holy Spirit called me out some porch to a little church where maybe I'd have to have hundreds of dollars a day to take care of that. They couldn't do it. But you see, I don't need nothing with this more God. See? I, I don't, so if he calls me anywhere, no matter where it's at, if he's ten people or... And I preached to 500,000 one time, so... Uh, well, whenever it comes to that time, somebody is, God puts it on their heart and they come around and say, you know, the Lord said you were going somewhere, here's a check for it. That's it, by faith, you see. Well, he knows what we have need of. And so I just like to live like that. And then another thing, you know, I think we're going down in places, a lot of people that comes to my meetings are poor people, just like I am. And I, I want to stay just like they are. Would it look right now for a minister to go around and all great something, you know, like that, and tens of thousands of dollars and throwing it this way and that way, and, and some poor woman pulling a cotton sack on her back, picking cotton for about $3 a day, and eating fat bacon and cornbread. <laughs> I can't see that, you see. Christ on the earth and didn't have a place to lay his head. And he was our example. He was what is supposed to be. Now, not as I'm trying to get condemn man, I'm just trying to tell you about myself. Therefore, with no money, then I never attempted to start anything big, you know, and, and you can't start anything big anyhow. The biggest thing there is, we're going to it. <laughs> so, it's God. And I think we're all just the same size, and let's just stay like what I said, we're God's children. Now, I just love to read this Bible, and I uh, can't read it too well, and I sometimes mispronounce my words, but you bear with me for that. I, uh, I, one time I remember it was at Fort Wayne. I was preaching, and there had been uh, in the Assemblies of God packed this article, and then the Who's Who had it. The little girl, you might have read it about ten years ago. Had, um, she was uh, been, her eyes were operated, and the sight was gone, and and she was brought into me, and the Holy Spirit told her all about it and healed her right there. She could read the Bible or anything. And who's who packed it? That book, you know, the who's who on medical science and whatever more, the cheapest. And um, I remember a couple nights after that, I went back, back where Paul Rader wrote that song, Only Believe. And uh, I was sitting there hearing that come in. There was a, a man who really had an education. He must have. And so he come back. He said, Mr. Branham, can I speak to you? I said, uh, yes, sir. And um, he introduced himself, and, and he said, I just want to correct you in some things. I said, all right, sir. And he said, um, your grammar. Mm. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I know that. I said, I only got a seventh grade education. I said, we had ten children, and my daddy was sickly, and I had to go to work, and I had quit school just a little boy. He said, that's no excuse now. And I said, that, that's right. I said, I guess it isn't. But now, since I've got to serve in the Lord, I haven't got time to pray any of it. He said, well, you're, said the people out there, said, I noticed you last night. He said, all you people coming up here by this pole pit, said, and it go down. I said, well, what? I don't know any different. And he said, I said, what's wrong with that? Said, it isn't pole pit. Said, it's pulpit. He said, your congregation appreciates you more if you'd say pulpit. Well, I think the kind of comment that you have the wrong way. I said, brother, I said, I don't want to differ with you, but I don't believe that people cares whether I say pulpit or pulpit. Just so, and I'll preach the word of God and live the life. Okay? Amen. 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 But you don't know your Bible. I said, but I know the author real well. <laughs> I'd rather know, to know him is life. Now tomorrow night, come kind of early, because when I come up just a few moments ago in a cab out there, there were just strings of people, disappointed, some crying, leaving the place, and they just turned away. So I uh, come as early as you can to get your prayer card. Now, uh, just before we um, look on the Word, let's speak to the author just in a minute. Heavenly Father, this is your Word, and we... Read in the Bible that we're cleansed by the water of the Word. And we know in the Old Testament how they took the heifer, the red heifer, and killed her, the whole congregation, and she was burned. And then uh, ashes was kept outside the courts for a, a waters of separation, that, that the hands that handle this must be clean hands. And I, I pray thee, God, is this waters of separation, the Word that separates us from death to life. Cleanse our thoughts, our hearts, Lord. 
And if there be anything you find in us that's not just right, cleanse it, Lord, by this water of separation tonight. Take our sins away, Father. We, we want to stand daily before you, dying to ourselves that we might live in Christ. Bless the word as we read it. And you promised that it would, re- would not return void, but it, it would accomplish that which it was purposed to do. And we pray that you'll grant this through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, we find, I'm going to read just a little bit from the sixth seal. Out of the book of Revelation is found in the sixth chapter of the Revelation. And then we'll begin with the twelfth verse. And then I also want to read from Hebrews 12, 25, uh, to, for another little quotation for some scriptures. I got written down here in a, um, a few things I would like to speak on, if the Lord willing. And now, on Revelation 6, 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great man, and the rich man, the chief captains, and the mighty man, every bondman, and every freeman hid themselves in dens and in rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that set us upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, in the book of Hebrews, the twelfth chapter, and beginning with the twenty-fifth verse, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from that from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has a point saying, Yea, once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things which are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptable with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, this is a, a little text that I would like to uh, draw from there, to make a text out of it, if I should call it. I hope I don't hold you too long. And so um, don't forget tomorrow night now to come early to get the prayer cards, and we'll have a prayer line where we pray for all the people who's got the prayer cards. Uh, my text tonight is the world is falling apart. It's a very odd text, but I was thinking today as uh, I had the glorious opportunity and the grand privilege to walk with uh, Brother Vic, this honorable, noble servant of Christ, with Brother Joseph, my precious friend also. We had... Um, uh, well, it was dinner to me. I think it's lunch to you all here, but if that's dinner, then uh, this is dinner tonight, and that's lunch and breakfast. Where does my supper come in? I, say, I feel like I've left out something. And then as we went to, to dinner and come back down the street, we were noticing they were putting up, uh, starting to put up things for Christmas. We are approaching the Christmas season. And... Right on a month away, but all the stores is getting out all their Christmas sales. How far are they miss the meaning of Christmas? Right. It's become a, a, just a commercial act. All the holidays have become that. Right. Mother's Day, Father's Day, and every day ought to be Mother and Father's Day. And, and they have uh, all the Easter. Santa Claus took the, re- uh, took the birthplace. 
A rabbit, a chicken, a little duck took the resurrection time. It's all chickens and ducks and eggs and what's that got to do with the resurrection? It's too bad we that puts it before our children. A many a little boy out here tonight can tell you more about Davy Crockett than he can tell you about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a great commercial thing. They take clothes like some cowboy or some hero and or something of some uh, outlaw or something and and they sell clothes that looks like him and and then the, all the little children know about it and read the history of it if we could just get the program of christ over to the people like that you usually try to impersonate what you read yeah the readers i remember it's been, always been that way with me i remember one time as a little boy about 12 years old down in the public library i got a hold of the uh one of zane gray's books called the lone ranger I rode Mama's broom to death as a hobby horse around around the house till I broke it up. Later on, I read Edgar Rice Boer's story of Tars and the Apes, and I slept in a tree because I, I, I was reading that. That was all my mind. And oh, one day I got a hold of something was real. <laughs> a truth, not a fiction. And ever since then, I don't want my life to be like his. I found something that was real when I read the Bible in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, as we approach this season, it's very familiar. The world is just about the same condition it was 2,000 years ago when he come on earth on his first advent. When he came to the earth, the earth had met its time ever so often. The world gets in such a chaotic condition until there's nothing can help it. We've had this several times these preludes and we we find that each time when it meets this condition and it causes people to to start praying and they feel that everything's played itself out and to all of our systems and everything that we have play itself to the end it did that in the Andalusian world and so forth uh, politics and and other things just comes to its end and there's no more to it and I, I think all that's done by God for a purpose to kind of uh, rejuvenate, to kind of bring back. It has a way of renewing itself. And I think it's just a, a law of God that these things come to that place. Uh, the time of Christ's first advent, uh, I believe we could say the world was falling apart. It was a corruptible time in politics, a corruptible time in, in religion. The whole systems had become corrupted. That mingle uh, in injecting other things and man-made theories into religions and so forth until the whole thing was corruptible, and the world was a falling apart, and the world at that time was praying for a Messiah. Now the Romans was praying for a Messiah. The Greeks wanted a Messiah. The Jews wanted a Messiah, and. God gave them a Messiah, but they didn't want it the way he sent it. And I wonder today in our chaotic time that if all of us reaching this place again as we approach Christmas, we find the world about the same condition, morally decayed, and politics is decayed, religious life is, is decayed, denominationalism is decayed, and everything is just corrupted. And all of us are looking for uh, something to help us out of it. All of us are expecting a Messiah. I wonder if God sent us the Messiah, if we would just about do the same thing they've done in the past. We wouldn't know him. We wouldn't know who he was. I don't think the world would recognize him at all. And notice why. Here's my thought, the reason why. The Romans... They had their idea of what a Messiah should be. Each one of us has got our own ideas. Each denomination has its ideas. We've been taught, drawn out on charts and everything, what the Messiah should be. How it's going to be. Our church is the ones going to receive it. Well, the Jews, the Pharisees thought that, and so the Sadducees taught their side. Same thing, you see. Spirits doesn't die, just the man that's occupied. See? The, the devil doesn't take his spirit, he only takes it, the man. And the good thing about it, God doesn't take his spirit, neither. See, it remains. Just the man. 
same spirit is up on Christ is up on the believer today, the true believer. Now, notice the Romans in that day were looking for a, a messiah, a, a politician. They wanted somebody uh, to come down from Jupiter or someone to come down with a chair of fire and, and a sun behind his head and he drove the chariots across the sky and wanted Jupiter to come down and give them the gimmick, uh, the military secret, how they could stomp out the whole world. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to beat down the Greeks and, and master the whole world. That's the kind of Messiah they wanted. Well, the Greeks wanted that kind of Messiah to come and tell them just exactly the kind of the strategy that they could use to beat the Romans down. See, that's kind. And the Jews, they were looking for a general. Some man that was coming with a rod of iron in his hand, and a lion of the tribe of Judah, and he was going to rule all nations and run Rome out into the river and drown them, and, and, and Israel was going to take over. That's the reason when he come, exactly the way the scripture said he would come, but they was looking for him in a different way. Amen. I wonder if it wouldn't be the same thing today if he come. Amen. If we wouldn't think that we have... Uh, our own ideas about what he ought to be and what he ought to look like and how he should wear his clothes and part his hair and everything. If it isn't just our taste, well, we wouldn't receive it, you see. I mean we the world today, you see. All right. They, uh, the, uh, the Jews, uh, they rejected the Messiah because that he didn't fit their taste. He didn't, uh, a few days ago, a fine uh, tailor out in Tucson was... Uh, cutting some trousers for me, and uh, he was Jewish. And I heard he's uh, broken uh, English, and, and I said, uh, what are you, uh, Jewish? He said, yes, sir. And he said, I suppose you're a Christian. I said, yes, sir. So he went ahead fixing on my trousers, and I thought I'd let him lead next. And he said, uh, well, he said, I have nothing against you, Christians. I said, thank you, sir. I have nothing against you. And he said, um, he said uh, uh, I said, what's your opinion of Christ? He said, he came uh, too early, and they said he was too young for the job. And I said, yes, sir. He said he was just a little too young for his job. He said, now, Christ, if, he, if Jesus would have come today, not Christ, they don't believe it. He said, if Jesus would have come today, his program would have been all right. He said, it's something or another like Rockefeller and Goldwater. He said, they're fighting one another and in the same party. And he said, you see, uh, they, they oughtn't to be doing that. I said, that's correct. Said when Jesus came, said he come fighting his own party, his people. I said, oh no, he came to his own and his own received him not. I said, that was interesting. So uh, I'll let him rest till I get back. He came a little at a time because uh, I remember God blinded his eyes so that I could see. See, so I, I'm very grateful to the race that I certainly am. Don't you worry, Israel, if you're sitting here at your time sooner than hand. Sure. Now, many times. We say that Jesus was Jewish. No, he wasn't. No, he was not Jew. He wasn't Jew nor Gentile. He was God. Amen. See, the hemoglobin is where the life cell is. And the life cell was a creating cell by God. There was no, no um, uh, social life between God and Mary. There's not even a sensation. He created both germs. That's right. Egg and cell. And he was neither Jew nor Gentile. He was that breach between he was God. And if he was Jewish blood, we're lost. If he was Gentile blood, we're lost. He was the blood of God, created without sexual desire. That's, that's the reason our faith can look there and stand assured. That's it. So he died for both. Now we find that when he came, oh, he didn't come in the taste of the Jews. So they condemned him. And we, we can't stand nothing about it because we do the same thing. What a cause is. I believe there was a cause for that. And I think it is because they had tucked the word of God and made it of no effect by their traditions. Jesus said so. He said, you, by your traditions, has made the word of God of no effect. That's right. It wasn't effective because it added and projected into it their traditions. And when you, you can't add nothing to that. You can't take nothing from it. It's, that's just the way it is. That's the way God preserved it. We can't add creeds and dogmas and things to inject in that. That don't need any help. That's, that's Him. 
That's him in letter form. And the Word is a seed, and the seed in the right kind of ground will grow. If you don't dig it up every morning to find out where it's grown or not, you just plant it, commit it to God, and leave it there. That's the way it grows. Just leave it the way it's in the ground, and that's where it's supposed to be, the ground of your heart. Faith is watered at our I said, I, it's, God said so, it's mine. That's the way to do it. So the whole world then was falling apart like it is today. Every nation was looking for someone to, to uh, hold them out of uh, this tragedy that was about to strike the world and trying to hold them together. The nations were looking for something, and, and each nation was looking for it, but they looked like they didn't want to accept what God sent them. They were asking for a man, a Messiah, that would stop out the rest of the nations and God give them a baby. Asking for a general and got a baby. God knows what they had need of. He humiliated them. That's the way God does. He humiliates us when we think we know something. Like he said to Job, you so got so much wisdom. Why was you where I laid the foundation of the world? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Where was you, Job, when his wisdom was done? See, God humiliates us when we get to thinking we're something great. When we think our organization is the only one, God will come back from something that's nowhere, rise up something and humiliate us by it. Right. He always does it that way. Yes, see, they asked for a general and got a baby. God knows what they had need of. That's right. They asked for a general and got a savior, although they thought they were saved. But God's visit to them showed that they wasn't. Maybe that's a whole lot of what's the matter today. The world thinks they're saved by joining church, but they need a Savior. That's the same today. If that isn't the picture of the world today, I don't know the world. That's just about the way it is at this Christmas again. We find the same thing, the world falling apart. If you go to this, that's gone. You go to this, that's gone. It's got that way so that we will come to this. It, it takes all the props out from under us so that we can... We can have to come to the only resource there is, and that's eternal life. It's uh, now looking today as it was then for some system to hold it together. As it was then, it is now again falling apart, and the religious world then was looking for a promised Messiah to do this, and God keeps His promise. He never fails to keep His promise. In all ages... When the world was falling apart in the time of Noah, God sent him a mighty prophet. What did he do with it? Turn it down. What is the prophet? The one the Word comes to. It's the Word of God again. In the time of, of Noah, they said, in Moses' time, the whole system was falling apart. They sent a prophet. In Elijah's time, the whole system was falling apart. They sent a prophet. Every time when the world gets in this chaos, they send a prophet. And then at this first Christmas, he sent the word in its fullness. See, the word, a portion of the word in the prophet. Prophet had the message for that age. And he went forth giving the prophet. And what did they do with him each time? Stone him. They didn't agree with their systems. And put him to death. Jesus said, you do garnish the walls of the prophets, the tombs, and your the fathers. Put them in there. And you testify that... Uh, it's you're their children. See, they do it. It's just too bad, but that's, that's the world. See, it's always God sends His Word, and wisdom tries to burst the Word. That's the way it was at the beginning. The very thing started the whole system of sin was because somebody, Eve, Satan, produced a better plan than God's. He produced wisdom. They eat from the tree of knowledge. Wisdom always takes you away from God. Faith brings you back to God. You don't know God by your uh, great wisdom. You, uh, it's no good. It's of the world. It's foolishness to God. But it pleased God to the foolishness of preaching His Word to save the lost. So God always used something foolish and simple when He uh, called His disciples. If he would have uh, chosen Caiaphas and the great priests that they had trained for that hour, there'd been something to brag on. They had their doctor's degree and everything, but he goes down and gets ignorant man, fishermen, who couldn't even read their own name or write their own name, that he might take nothing and make something out of it. 
Even the great St. Paul said he had to forget all he ever knew yeah. that he might find Christ. Yeah. He told the Corinthian church, I never come to you with the excessively of words of wisdom of this world. Because you build your faith in that. And look, today people don't want a pastor that he can talk just proper and make all these nouns and pronouns. And uh, If that be so, I couldn't get no pulpit because I don't even know what the difference between a noun and a pronoun. Now, the only thing I know is I know him. And that's all I hear tonight. So he's my He's my now and pronoun. He's my right. Now, the thing we want to know is him. But you see, our religious system has uh, adopted the educational system and took the place of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's done. Now, in the days of Noah, the days of Moses, they sent the prophets to them. And what do they do? Stone them. Put them to death. Saw them to pieces, burn them, any way you get rid of them, get them off with their hands. Yeah. Jesus taught the very fine uh, parable when he said there was a man, a great man made a, had a vineyard and put dressers in it. And he sent a servant and they killed him. He sent another servant and they killed him and so forth. And said, finally, he said, I, I'll send the son and they'll regard him. And the, the, the dressers of the vineyard said, this is error. Let's kill him. That was God's son that he sent. Sending the prophets, sending his word, the word, God. You remember, every fallen generation, there's only one thing that can bridge this world together. That's the word of God. This world was made by the word of God. It's framed together by the word of God. That's the only thing that will ever keep it together is the word of God. Our Hebrew said, we understand that the world was framed by the word of God. People doubt the Word of God in the very dirt that you're sitting on is the Word of God made manifest. The very seats that you're sitting in is the Word of God made manifest. God speaks it and it has to happen because it's uh, the Word of God. Now, the only thing that can keep it together will never be a political system. It'll never be a UN. It'll never be any of these organizations. It'll be the Word of God that keeps the, the world together. That's the only thing that I can recommend today to keep the world from falling apart right now is back to the Word of God. That's God's program always. In the Garden of Eden, Satan come along and said to Eve, he said, oh, you should take the fruit of the tree. And uh, she said, but the Lord said, no, he said, now, oh, surely you'll not die. See? He knows as long as people stay fortified, this is what we're supposed to stay fortified by, is the Word. See? We are surrounded by the Word. The Word is in you. God, in you, around you, wherever you go, it's the Word, the Word. Keep Him always before you. Remember, be conscious of Him everywhere. Now, when even Adam walked like that, there was no death. The man and woman that walks like that now, there's no death to them. they got eternal life. When you're, when you're surrounded and kept by the Word. Now watch. Wisdom comes up to verse the Word. And when it does, he broke that barrier. And when Satan found out that that was the place he could hit the human race, that's exactly where he's hit it every time. Even in the man of Christ's spirit, so close that we to see the very elect in the last days, he comes in the form of religion. Now, there's not no such a thing as the Communistic Party ever fooling anybody. They're, a, they're anti-God to begin with, but that's not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is religion so close it would deceive the very elected. Look at Judas Iscariot, walked right with the church and professed Christ. He'd done everything the rest of them did. Went out and even cast out devils and come back rejoicing with them. Correctly. Matthew 10. But when it comes to the place at Pentecost, to receive eternal life, he showed his colors. Amen. That's where it comes today. The devil lets you have all the church joining you want to. But when it comes to the time when you receive the Holy Ghost, he'll his heart it's a bunch of holy rollers or something. Amen. He don't want nothing to do with that. And Judas and his system can follow right up to that hour. Because that's where Judas deceived the world up to that spot, but he couldn't do it there. That's the elected right there. Amen. Now, he can come that close, but he... Uh, but he can't come the rest of the way because if he would, he'd be your brother then. So he can't do that. Somebody said, you know, the devil got me. No, he never. You went out after him. He never come in and got you. Because you are dead and your life is hid in God and sealed by the Holy Ghost. The only way he could ever get in there is the same way you did. So he just invited you and you walked out to him. That's all. See, it isn't. If he come in after you, he can't come in there. For you are in Christ, dead to yourself. 
Amen. I'm not amen myself, but that means so be it. And I, I, I know it's true. Um, experienced it and know that it's true. It's passing from death unto life to receive Christ in you. All right. Now we find then that uh, the religious world in that day was falling apart. And um, they they had always done it before. And why? It's because that the coming prophets and the coming Messiah did not meet their specification. They're a theological term for it. They, they didn't. And that's the way it would be today. Uh, this is why I believe today that we're, we're stunted in this day because uh, in the move of God, because it, even in the churches it doesn't exactly come to the terms of what they've got to figure out it should be. They figure out that there should be a time that certain, certain things will happen and, and then when the real kernel of it comes down, well, then they, they reject that. Amen. See? And uh, what's the use of putting up electric wire if you refuse the dynamo? See? They can't get no current in it. It's just a dead wire. Amen. That's what's the matter with the church today. We got all the wires up and press the button. There's no light. What we need to do is get connected. That's all. That's all. Get connected with Christ. All our lives of our emotion, the lives of our mind, connected in Him. You say, well, I, I tell you, I, I, uh, I believe I, you haven't got no, you ain't got no thought coming. Amen. That's right. You say, I think this, I, you haven't got a thought. I haven't either. The Bible said, let the mind that was in Christ be in you. And he was always about the Father's business. So that's the only thought you ought to have. What God said about it. Not what somebody else said, but what God said. That's all he said. He said, let every man's word be lie and mine be the truth. That's the thing to cut the world back together, but they won't receive it. Now, we know they won't because they never did. All right. We wonder then if the, the answer is today, the cry today is for help for the Messiah to come. And I believe sometimes if we would, if he would stand it, I wonder if we would do the same thing he did then. All of our po politics, both in religion and, and both in the uh, federal life and so forth, is polluted. Uh, we polluted our worship with man-made design fashions, fashioned and designed a man-made to fit every cult that's on the face of the earth. Everyone's got their own idea again. It must become again like it was in the days when God rose up the mighty prophet Isaiah, said your sacrifices and things has become a stench in my nose. See, Israel first, when God told him to take a sacrifice and go offer it, well, it was a great thing. You can imagine a Jew going down the road with a, a lamb, a fat little lamb or a bullock or whatever he was. It was a Passover. And he goes down, lays his hands upon the, the sacrifice that's connecting himself, identifying himself with the sacrifice when he puts his hand on it. The priest killed the, the beast, the little lamb, whatever it was. And as the little fellow died, kicking and blading, the blood splashed upon his hands and the worshiper in sincerity know that that should be him, but the lamb was taking his place. That's what Jehovah required because it was a type of Christ. But one time that kept on going on until it became a family tradition. Amen. They offered the land just the same, but there was no sincerity about it. Amen. God said they stink in my nostrils. Amen. And today, years ago, we used to find the people in deep sincerity in worship. And today it's become a big glamour of Hollywood. Amen. Just a, some kind of a trained uh, uh, music and uh, women up on the platform with their clothes tight enough to skin on the outside almost as dancing around on the platform. No sincerity and not almost making an, uh, uh, just an outright uh, ridiculous shame of professing Christianity. I wonder if our offerings hasn't become kind of a stench in his nose again. Our differences. It's such a shame that the enemy has taken our American women and stripped them down out there on the streets and why, it's, it's a disgrace. No wonder that little boys and little girls and things are in such a shape as they are today. They're always trying to pattern after some woman out here in Hollywood, married four or five times, and she'll come out with some sort of a uh, nude clothes on, and all the little girls in the country are pattern after that. What a pity. That's too bad. Yes, sir. It's too bad that you got into the church. The beautiful virtue that God gave a woman to be a mother. It's been marred, and that's the backbone of the nation. You break motherhood, you broke the nation right then. That's one thing that helps hold it together. Real, genuine parenthood. I was talking to the cab driver coming down. We were talking about some 
delinquent children up there, and he said, I think it's the parents. I said, Amen. All right, I don't know who you are, but you're on the right road. And I said, That's right. I said, It's too bad that they took the, the Bible out of the home and gave them a deck of cards. And that started in the church. I was standing on the elevator a few moments ago, and a certain woman on there talking to another said, Well, you know, he said, This is a wonderful thing. Our church is giving a card party. And how they were going to have some kind of a Thanksgiving turkey affair that there's going out of a Protestant church. Oh, my. Gambling, lottery, bunco, dances. Oh, when it gets to a time that people have to do stuff like that to entertain the church. A church born again, the Holy Ghost entertains the church with eternal life. But people, they don't want that because they're pleasure stricken. It's too bad that the things happen the way we have long ago, too long ago, has the beautiful virtue of women and their fine dress has bowed before the shrine of the goddess of Hollywood. It's a truth. It's such a pity that the world's got in a place like that. The nation backbone is broken. Sex appeal is many times regarded as fashion. Modern. People dressing. Going out on the street. You know what the Bible said? I'll tell you. I was speaking on that one time, and there's a noted minister said to me, he said, uh, why don't you leave away from them women doing that, saying that? And I told him, I said, said you ought to teach them how to become prophetess and so forth like that. I said, how am I going to teach them algebra when they won't even learn their ABCs? <laughs> Always believe Christ, you know, ABC. And so uh, I said, how can you do that? All these things have just been a great conglomeration that's weeded into the church. It's too bad it's getting amongst we Pentecostal people. Old people, stop thinking. You may call me a fanatic now, but at the day of the judgment, you will shake my hand. Uh, I, I love you with, with a godly love. And I want you to be right, friends. What's use of taking any chance on such things as that? A lady said to me, he said, well, Mr. Branham, they, they don't, they, uh, that's the only kind of clothes they make for women. I said, they still make goods and sell sewing machines. You use the whole excuse. That's right. Look, let me say one thing again, as this. You know, if you dress like that and some sinner on the street looks at you in the wrong way, you're going to answer at the day of judgment for committing adultery with that sinner. You might be as virtuous to your husband as you can be. You might be as virtuous to your boyfriend, as loyal as you know how to be. But in the sight of God, you're a street heart. You say, is that right? Through that by the word, Brother Brown. You said, ask you anything if it was a word. Yes, sir. Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if you present yourself like that, you're a cause of it. That's exactly. Though you be innocent in yourself, you presented yourself to that sinner like that. When he answers for it, you'll be the one to be guilty. Oh, get you some clothes and cover up. And I'm like, ladies, that's right. And you, man, you that let your wives do a thing like that, where I'm kind of close, don't you have no respect for you or her either one? My, let your wife sit and smoke cigarettes in the house and blow it. What are you, and then call yourself a Christian? Uh, I can't understand that. You say, well, now, wait a minute. Um, uh, uh, by other fruits you shall know them. That's what I'm talking about. See? That's right. If you love the Lord with all your heart, you say, well, I've just got to smoke them. That's my pleasure. Your pleasure, my pleasure's in the Lord. Your pleasure's in the Lord. If you die out to the world, God is my joy. He is my peace. He is my sacrifice. He's my God. He's my love. He's all in all that I have need of. I need it in Christ.
you know, reverent. They're supposed to wait on them things, you know. When the Spirit speaks, breaks into a message and speaks like that, there must be something important fixing to happen to you. interpretation right we are to warn the people see the coming of the Lord and that's warn with the right kind of a life behind it because you can't talk to a man living in any way and then go tell him he knows he's living as well as you are see let's get right and get ready because I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to know these things and to be ready for this great thing that's fixing to happen yes yes sir the hour the world is now falling apart the all systems are falling apart why is it? It's, it's got to come that way. See, it's, uh, uh, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And all these earthly things have to give away to it. Now, we find out that God promised to supply all of our needs we had need of in this journey. Is that right? But remember, he only supplies them on conditions. We've got to meet his condition first. If we do not meet his condition, he will not meet our condition. We've got to do the thing that's right first. We've got to go down to the bottom and build up. That's exactly We can't start at the top and come down. We've got to go to the bottom and build up. Go back to the bottom. Now, he'll meet our condition. All of his promises are on condition. But we try to reverse this by our traditions. We try to make God something else. We are going to inject our tradition and say it's just a little better. Or that's the way the people try to think it. Now, I'm not just speaking to this church right here, this group of people. I'm speaking as, uh, to the world. It's being taped here. It'll go all around the world. What we say. We want our wants supplied. But he supplies our needs. That's, that's the difference. We want our wants and he gives us our needs. But he knows what we have need of. And we would most surely, the world would today, accept it if it come according to our tradition. Oh, the Baptists would like to say it's according to what we believe. It's to see you were all wrong. The message say, now nah, you Baptists are wrong. It's according to what? It come the way we believe it. But I imagine it'll come different from what any of us think about it. That's right. It's going to come the way God has ordained it to come. And it's just not in man to be able to cut this thing out and say it's that way. Now, would you, we wonder today what's, why the gifts and things are not in the church operating the way they should be. Why the gifts are put in the church to separate and take sin out, to keep the church clean. It's, a, it's God's uh, uh, toxin that's given to the church. It's God's also his disinfect that he puts into the church to kill out all the, the parasites that, that tear up the church. And, and uh, it, it's, God sprays his church over with his word. And that keeps all the, the termites out, you know, so the church can grow. The plant. And God knows what it takes to do it. Well, you say, uh, it's just like a, a little baby crying uh, for your razor when you were shaving. And you, you little baby saw her, give me that razor, Daddy. Give me that razor. Your little son, two, three years old, just screaming, jump up and down the floor, give the razor. Well, you know better to do that. Well, you wouldn't give that baby that razor. He doesn't know how to handle it. That's the reason we don't find a more divine gifts in what we do. They push it off on some kind of a tradition over in some denomination. They don't know how to handle it. God knows what to do with it. Well, you might say, the little boy might say to you, you refuse to raise it and say, I see you handling it, Daddy, but see, you're older. You know what to do with it. That's the way when the church becomes from a, a little baby toddling around to a real virtue of, of sons and daughters of God, then things are going to be different. Yes, sir, the church ought to be acting as sons and daughters. When we ought to be teachers, we have to be taught. Reminds me of my colored friends here tonight. My brothers and sisters will excuse this expression. Years ago down the south, they used to sell uh, people when the slavery was going on down in the south. And they took those 
poor people that would take them out and uh, auction them off like some kind of a used car lot. You have a bill of sales, a human life. It never was God's will to have no man rule over another. Man made, God made man and man made slaves. We're all off the same tree. One can give the other in the blood transfusion. Whether we're yellow, black, brown, red, or whatever we are. We're all Adam's race. The country we lived in didn't change our colors. It has nothing to do with it. Not at all. Jesus died to save the sinner, no matter who it was. And there used to be a broker's came come by and would buy them people. Just like you'd buy a, a car, come by and buy so many used cars and take it and sell it somewhere else. It'd come to the plantations and find these poor people out there and look around and find out which one was good workers and big, strong men and women. And they would sell them. Take the big, strong man and breed him to big, strong women like you would cattle or something to get a bigger, heavier slave. I wonder what hell would be full of that kind a uh, thing like that. And here there was a little old mother with her babies crying, her husband auctioned off. It was terrible. And then the first thing you know, this one broker came by a plantation, he was tall one day, and uh, he was looking over the slaves, he said, how many you got? I said, oh, we got about 200 out there. And so uh, he watched them, and the people were sad. They were away from their home, their loved ones. They were brought from Africa here and brought in by the Boers and sold down here in the South. And um, they, they know they never go back home. They, they were finished. They never get to go back. And they were sad. You, they couldn't make them work hard. They'd, they'd have to whip them and everything else to make them work because they know they'd never get back home. Their daddy was over there, maybe mother here, daddy over there, and uh, maybe the children here and their father somewhere. Oh, it's terrible. And one day, this broker came by and looking at this bunch of slaves, and he noticed there's one of those young slaves out there that they didn't have to whip him. Yeah, he's chest out, his yeah. chin up. He walked around. He was right on the spot. Yeah. And the broker said, say, I want to buy that one. And the owner said, but he's not for sale. So why? So I have to keep him. He said, he must be the boss over the rest of them. He said, no, no. He ain't the boss. But I said, maybe you feed him better. He said, no, they all eat out there in the galley together. He said, well, what makes him so much different from the rest of the slaves? He said, I often wondered that myself till one day I found out. Yeah. That over in the homeland where he come from, his father is a king of the tribe. And though he's an alien, he still knows he's a king's son. He conducts himself like one. Oh, if we are the sons and daughters of the king, the king of kings, let's uh, in, conduct our character as Christians. That's right. Yes. We are aliens. We're pilgrims and we're strangers here. This is not our world. We're seeking a kingdom that is to come. This is not our home. Though we be tossed about and made fun of by the world and called this, that, and the other, and old-fashioned and all like that, why do you care? You don't want to be a pattern yourself after a, some kind of a movie star or some television star or something. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. That's how it's God be our shark of God. We know sons and daughters of the king. Her character reflects his presence. Oh, how rough it gets. But here, college, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there with rubies and diamonds and shadows. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. We're the children of the king. With Jesus, our Savior, I am a child of the king. Let's conduct ourselves like our father. Going someday we will go home to be with him. Yes, yes, they, they want a Messiah, but they want it under their own conditions. Yeah, they want a Savior. They did it and want it now the same way. For the same reason. For the denominations and politics has taken the place of the Holy Spirit. The ministers, instead of being too many of them, are led by the, the religious politics instead of letting the Holy Spirit lead them. See? Some church will give them a little better offering or something, and away they go to get a feather in a hat or something like that. But that that's too bad. We ought to be led by the Holy Spirit. God sent the real leader of the church, and that's the Holy Ghost. Our educational system in our churches has led us far away from the presence of God. It's too bad that we put our boys, I'm talking of Pentecostals now, out into the seminaries and things, hatch them out like incubator chickens. That's right. I always felt sorry for an incubator chicken. It was, uh, wasn't hatched right. 
He chirps and he ain't got no mammy to go to. Just turned out by a big machine or a regime. That's the way they seem to be turning out preachers today with some kind of a doctor's degree and send him into a church and sometimes he knows more about God than a hot and top and know about an Egyptian knife. What we need today is a good old fashioned backwood sky blue sin killing religion and the baptism of the Holy Ghost back into the church again. A cleaning out gun barrel straight sky blue religion. We need a cleaning out and a starting over again. That's the truth. Church, I'm not beside myself. I may be mad, as I said last night, but I'm, I feel good this way. I never did feel this way the other way, so I, I just like to stay this way. Yes, sir, I did lose my mind. I had to to find the mind of Christ. Every other believer has to. That's right. We have to find the mind of Christ by losing our own mind. The educational system has taken us away. I live in a college town where the University of Arizona is there, and I was saying, thinking this, what can science do for you? They can take something and say this was so many hundred years ago. Now they found out it wasn't so many hundred years ago. They haven't got one thing yet scientifically proven that the world has ever had any life on it any more than 6,000 years. They pick up bones and they used to take different measurements and say how it was. Now, they wouldn't confess it. A big professor and I stood up there in Arizona and said, they won't profess it. No, but they found out that the age of the bone has been because of the chloride and stuff in the water and also the salt turned it like that and aged it. It absolutely wasn't time to have done it. Amen. Hey, man, God's Word still worry me. The same yesterday, day, brother. They can never be able to disprove it. That's the thing that will hold the world together. Not an educational system. Anything that you adopt and still that is an antichrist move. Yes. Exactly right. It's against the principles of Christ. Back to the Word. Christ is the Word. Yes. The Word made flesh and dwell among us. Education can never give us life. Education can never... Science can't give us life. The world can't give us life. The church can't give us life. Theology can't give us life. There's only one thing that can give you life. That's Christ. He is life. He is part of life. Some time ago, in a city in Canada, I was going up on an elevator, and there was uh, having a bunch of Americans up there, and it was it was some kind of a meeting. I won't call the name of it because there might be someone in a certain lodge in here, and I wouldn't want to hurt your feelings. But they was going up on the the, uh, the elevator in a big hotel, and I was having a meeting there, and. Uh, you couldn't get on the elevator hardly for the whiskey bottles and things. And I said to the, uh, to the elevator boy, I said, what's all this? He said, the Americans has visited us tonight. Oh, for goodness. <laughs> Many of them. And then I went down. It's got off the, of the stage or the, the little escalator or elevator, rather, and started out as a hall. And there was two young women standing down there with just their underneath garment on. They had a bottle of whiskey in their hand, and they were drinking. And they started down, and drunk man coming out of the house, a drunk, or the little rooms trying to catch him and pulling their clothes down. And it was horrible looking. And they come down, and I just ducked back in a little hall and waited until they passed by a little door. And they stopped in front of me, and nice-looking women. And they were standing there just with their little underneath skirt on, all the clothes they had. They took this bottle and tried to pour it on one another. One pulled up her underneath garment as high as she could pull it, throw her leg up in the air and holler, whoopee, this is life. I couldn't stand the more of it. I stepped out and I said, sister, I beg your pardon, that's death. That's death. She said, come have a drink. And I said, wait just a minute. I said, you said that was life. I said, that's perverted life. Why do you try to do a thing like that? Come to find out, I said, I am a minister of the gospel. I'm an American too. Now I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of you to call yourself an American. And up here like that, come to find out one of them was a Sunday school teacher. And she started crying. First she started to run and I grabbed both of them by the hand and she drunk they couldn't get away. I said, wait, we're going to pray right here. That is the way it seems right. What do you say? They're just having a little clean fun. A little clean fun? Nothing. That thing doesn't... I don't care how much Sunday school teacher you are. If that thing's in your heart, God can't dwell in that unclean place. What we need is an old-fashioned holiness revival to sweep the church from one end to the other. Yes, sir, we don't do that. That should not be permitted. But it's Americans having a little clean fun. Set an example as a Christian nation. Oh, my. Educational system. That isn't life. That's death. What makes a person do that? Why do they do it? What makes the world do the way they do? Because they reject this. 
There's some little place in a man's heart that thirsts for God. A little place a man is made to thirst. You're set up like that. That's what makes you drink. That's what makes you do these things. It's because there's something in you that craves for satisfaction, thirsting. And God forbid that a man will try to satisfy and hush that holy call of God with the substitute that the devil would give him. You have no right to do that. That's God calling to you. That stuff is a thirst of death. And if you won't take Christ in there to fill that up, the devil will give you a substitute of death in it. It's right. You have no right to do that. How dare any man or woman to hush that holy call in there of God calling. And because you won't receive it, then the devil will see it satisfied with something else. This what satisfies it. God's word I've hid in my heart that I sinned not against him. That's right. God in the heart is what settles the question. Yes, sir. Science can't give you life. Education can't give you life. Denomination can't give you life. Schools can't give you life. Nation can't give you life. Church can't give you life. It's only God can give you life. He's the only one that can do it. Now, we see exactly the, what the prophet said would come to pass in this day. The prophet Paul. In uh, 2 Timothy 3, we find out that the time was coming when the church would be heady. High-minded, know it all. See? High-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Amen. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good. Amen. You say that's communist. No, no, that's professed Christians. Listen, read the next verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Why to turn away from such stuff? Denying the power of the resurrection. Denying that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, The promise isn't to you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's what the Holy Ghost for. As long as God still calls, the Holy Ghost is still here to fill every hungry heart that God called. But we substitute something else. We try to satisfy that feeling by, by joining church. You just deaden that feeling by doing that. You ain't satisfied with that. That won't satisfy. There's only one thing will satisfy. That's when Christ comes into a man's life. Because he's made in the image of God. And he's made in the statue of God. And God didn't give you this trip here on earth to be this, that, or the other. But be a son and daughter of God. And there's nothing else to satisfy. That's the only thing that will hold our, our world together. And it's take not our man's economy, but take God's economy and his way of doing it through his word. That will hold it together. That's the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred mind is right to that above. That's right. What the world needs today is a good old time St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost back again. Where the Spirit of God falls amongst the people and signs and wonders appear. Life sparks off of an anvil. Yes, sir, we need it. That's what we have to have to hold together. Then we expect God to meet us in our traditions. Oh, to keep the world from falling apart, we expect him to come to our system. Now, that's exactly what they thought back there. Now, if the Messiah comes in this age, we've got a fine high priest, Caiaphasus. We got uh, Lebensky, all these priests along here. You see, fine man, we schooled them, schooled them. They know what they're talking about. But when he come... He bypassed every one of them. Amen. He didn't even touch their system. Amen. Besides that, he said, You're of your father the devil, and his works you do. You generation of snakes in the grass, he said. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Watch the word of God come out in that review. Oh, it certainly didn't meet their theological test, and it wouldn't today either. It doesn't. When they see him stand there and perform the sign of the prophet to show that he was Messiah, what do they say? He's Beelzebub. That's an evil spirit. And Jesus said, that's blasphemy. And when the Holy Ghost comes and you speak against that, it'll never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. But you see the system today? It's the same thing. We formed our own system. That's the reason our system will never hold this world together. They might elect a president or a Abraham Lincoln and ever count in the United States and will never hold it together until we get back to the Word of God, back to the old-fashioned black back Bible that's got the truth. That's the only way we'll ever know God and keep our world together. It's back to the principles of Jesus Christ, back to His doctrine, back to the Holy Ghost again leading the church. 
That's why the truth has been so mishandled in this last days. It's because that when the God trying to get his program in and people have already denominated themselves off and such, they build up a fence so that the Holy Spirit can't get in there, keeping him out. We want God to save us in the, the very condition we're in. That's the way that I think you Pentecostal people. What did you start out at? Did you ever read the Zeus Street Admission? Did you ever read before the General Council ever started? The Pentecostal people were known because they come out of those denominations that separated. That's what they was. Come out from among them. They used to preach that all the time. Be separated, saith God. Get away from them traditions of man. And what did he do? He turned right back around and went back in the same gom you come out of. Now you're separated. One's a church of God, the other into this and that and this and that. You're separated, fussing with one another. Break that down. When I first come into the ministry, I thought everything was Pentecostal as one group. I come to find out this broke up as bad as the Baptist. The thing I did is stand right in the middle of both of them and say, we are brothers. That's all. But as long as you're firing at one another, Satan don't have to fire at you. But unless that bound to be broke and spread forth your tents way out down and taking every brother, then I tell you the great army of God will rise in the power of Jesus Christ. Go back to the Bible. You talk about a church where the rats and great it would come to pass. When we can tear down our traditions, forget all of our denominational things, and come right back on the basis of God's Word. But we want God to save us in the condition we are. we got to meet His condition. We don't, we don't meet us on ours, upon His. We want God to save us in the very thing that, uh, that He is polluting. Let God get back to the Word and love one another. That's the only thing that I know to do. God sends us prophets, and when we uh, put them to death, just exactly like Jesus said they would do. Then we find out, after a century or two, or a hundred years, or fifty years, God will send us a prophet or a messenger, and um, first thing you know, we'll criticize him, put him to death. Then after a while, after he's dead, you know, while well, the church will wake up, what do they do? They'll say, well, we'll build a denomination up on that. That's what happened to the Methodists, Baptists, and all the rest of you. Build a denomination. And the thing is, after he's done dead and his message is over, we're done living over into another place. Then you go back there, his message for that day, and you're trying to go back there and go into his tomb. When well, here's going on, now you're all the time. You forget the hour. Just like man. Man's always praising God for what he did do. And praising him for what he will do and ignoring what he's doing. That, that's, that's just the way of man. He's always done that. He thinks of what he has done, gives him thanks. Believe he's going to do something out here, but forget he's doing it all the time right here. He always overlooks it. That's the devil's business for him to do it that way. Yes, sir, our traditions. <laughs> yes, sir. The Messiah, he says, for another generation, something like that. He was back there. He is the same yesterday, day, and forever. <laughs> In his first advent, Jesus, the whole world was corrupted with politics and religions. All was crying for a Messiah. They wanted an anointed one. Israel wanted something and Rome wanted something and the rest of them. It's the same thing today. We all, each one, want a politician. We want something today. Now, today, Russia wants a Messiah. Russia wants a Messiah that will take them to the moon right quick. Get there before the rest of them will. That's what Russia wants. They want that kind of a Messiah. Some genius... Some fellow that's a, that's a, that's a scientific genius, and he'll know how to conquer outer space and go over there and plant the Russian flag before the Americans can get there. Oh, they're, they want their Messiah. They're trying their best to raise up one. All right. What do America want? What do you want, America? You're crying the loudest. <laughs> what do you want? You've been wanting a, an educated genius. You've been wanting a political genius. You got it. Though you had to invent a, a crooked boat machine to get it, but you got it. That's right. The world wants, that's what it wants. Now what are you going to do with it? You want to show how smart you was. You even put them on television to show that one could outsmart the other and you fell for it. Man, you got it now. Where, where's he going to lead you? Right back to Rome, of course. You see it right now. You church, you want a genius. What do you want? What do you, what's the church want? What are you wanting? You're wanting a smart, educated, intellectual minister to raise up that can conquer better than Billy Graham, to take them all back to your denomination. You got seminaries and things trying to hatch them out. Yeah, that's right. Now, I don't think that's true, but look, your, your action speaks louder than your words. You want a, you want a religious genius. 
one who can uh, lead you, your denomination, over them all, stomp out the Baptist, stomp out the Methodist, stomp out the Oneness, stomp out the Trinity, everything, walk over all of it. Oh, you're just getting the war down, trying to find him. That's the kind you want. But you know what you need? You need a Savior, just exactly what you need. That's what God knows you need is a Savior, and He sends it to you. But do they want it? No, sir. That don't fit their, uh, fit their ecclesiastical taste. It just doesn't work that way with them. But the whole world wants their genius. Now, what if Russia got their Messiah? Then what about us? You know, Germany got theirs not long ago, and many of you boys in the First World War remember that very well. See? They got it. You don't need that kind of a Messiah. It was in the wrong way. It was the wrong thing. It was contrary to God's Word. Just think, Napoleon, at the age of 33, he had conquered the world and died in defeat. He died in defeat. He was a provicious when he first raised up. And his great uh, success brought him in. He died an alcoholic. 7,000 prostitutes fought in his army. He died at 33 years old. And he tried to conquer the world. But he did it in the wrong way. Amen. But Jesus Christ at the age of 33, had conquered the world, death, hell, grave, sin, and sin on earth. Well, he was the Word of God made manifest. That's our Messiah. Amen. Sure, you always, we want a, we want a Messiah, but we want it in the way. I have to admit some things that got wrote down now. We're getting too late. We, uh, we have to admit some of it. But the world wants, wants their Messiah. The world wants one. The church wants one. And what if God sent him one? If God sent him a sign, what would he be? He would not be a religious politician. He would not be an intellectual giant, as we call it. Oh, no. What would he be? He'd be like Hebrews 13, 8. The same that he was. He's always been. He'd be the Word of God. made manifest. That's exactly he was God's Word. He is God's Word. He'll forever be God's Word. Even the, the sounding forth of His coming was always a prophet. Through the Word came to you. Hear the Word come in fullness. And now if He'd come again today, it would be a, a Word of God. Manifested Word of God. Vindicated Word of God. God living among us. That's the Messiah. He promised it. Hey, Amen. He'd be that pillar of fire again. He'd be the same Messiah that led Israel. Amen. He'd be the same Messiah. Sir, they'd turn it down like they always did. Certainly. Oh, of course, they want to build a great nation. We want to build a great church body. Today, we're thinking about, we want a great general church. All right, you're going to get it. You want a united church. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. Why do they want it like that? If the Messiah would come, he'd never set nothing like that in order. He'd be against it. Sure he would. But what do they want it for? What's the reason? It has to come that way. They want one man that can stand up and dictate the whole thing. You're going to get it. Amen. Exactly right. You will receive him because he's coming. Amen. Another will come and you will receive him, Jesus said. And they will. They will receive him. Why do they want to do that? People are wanting to things their own way. The Messiah would come. He'd just chuck the feathers off of you. Hallelujah. Amen. Talk about some preacher skinning down women and men. He would really skin them down. Amen. He did what he come. He said, you generation of vipers, you snakes of the grass, you're a part of the devil. If that Messiah would return to this polluted time, he'd do the same thing again. God would have vindicated his work just like he did in the beginning with the same kind of signs and wonders. He certainly would do it if he returned again. If we got that Messiah, be just like he wasn't the first time, because it couldn't be nothing else. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the Word. But what are we wanting? We wouldn't want that kind of Messiah. No, no, we want to be something like the world. What the people are trying to do, they want a Messiah that will let them live and, and do anything they want to and act like the world and live in the world and still hold their Christian profession. Right. You can't do that. If you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you, Jesus. Yes, sir. But that's the kind of Messiah the world wants. That's the reason it won't receive God's Messiah. It won't do it. This is His Messiah. Exactly. His Word is His Messiah. 
that Messiah in you does the works that the Word says it does. It reproduces Christ. Because Christ is in you. His life is in you. And it does just exactly what He's supposed to do, like He always did. Same way He did it. The same things that He did. Because He is the same. That's the Messiah that God sends. The Messiah of the world wants to just let them do anything they want to and get by. Oh, that's all right. Oh, these women across the country, these, you want it, you, you, you want your French dressing and all the big things. You got it. <laughs> you got a modern Ahab and Jezebel and, and fashion the church. That's right. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking truth. Do you know this nation is just exactly like Israel? They've done the same thing. Israel come in and drove the occupants out of that nation and took it. God gave it to them. And what did they do? They drove out the occupants of the nation and took it. First, they had great kings like David and Solomon. And after a while, they raised up a man called Jezebel, or, or um, Ahab. And he married Jezebel. And she was one of these little painted face flappers. And when he did, she was the one controlling. She told him what to do. He might have been the head, but she was the neck. And she told him what to do. And if this nation hasn't done the very same thing, the same thing. We come in here and drove out the Indians. We had a Washington and a Lincoln. But where we got today, with our own voting and politics and things, we set the system that we run from and made a nation out of it here. We brought it right back in here because it's a desire of the people. I'm neither Democrat or Republican. I'm a Christian. The whole thing is polluted. I cast my vote on Jesus Christ. Amen. On this work, I stand all over the ground. Yes, sir. Friends, we are not promised a system. Jesus wouldn't have nothing to do with a system. We wasn't promised a system. We were promised, what was we promised? A kingdom. How do you get into it? By one spirit. We're all baptized into this kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. A kingdom of eternal life with an eternal king. Getting forth his eternal word with an eternal people as the destiny, the eternal life. Falling apart. Europe is falling apart. Asia is falling apart. 
all the world's falling apart. But we are in a kingdom, an eternal kingdom. It cannot be moved. Amen. Where Christmas is every day. Amen. Living in the presence of the King. Glory. Don't answer guess about that. It is the truth. God's truth. God's complete truth. How I love Him for this. How good He is. You're sitting there looking at me, little woman there, with a black hat on, looking at me. You're in a kingdom. You believe it? In the presence of the king. Just had an operation for a bowel trouble. That's right, isn't it? It has been bothering you. It's been bothering you. Forget it. It's going to be well now. Ah! There's healing in the presence of the king in this kingdom. For with his stripes we were healed. Amen. Amen. The old colored brother sitting over on the end there had his hands up looking around trying to find me. You didn't find me, but you found him. That tumor that's in your side. If you believe with all your heart, God will take it out. You believe it? All right. God bless you. Amen. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Marvelous. Why do you doubt? Don't doubt. You've got asthma. You've got heart trouble. You've got arthritis. Everything you want God to call number by number. When he speaks to you, that's it. Mr. Lord, don't forget, don't forget that that's true. Please, God. Then you shall have what you want. Amen. This man sitting here with asthma, little fellow from Norway, you believe that God will cure that asthma and make you well? If you do, God will make you well. Amen. Why? All right, you can have it, sir. You didn't know you had that much faith, did you? But the kingdom of God has come and we're sitting with the Messiah. God's Messiah. See, why do you say that so? Messiah. What is it, Brother Ram? The Bible said the word of God is more powerful than any kingdom. Sharper than a two-edged sword. It's a desire of the thoughts that's in the mind that you can fire. It's God's kingdom. Hallelujah. We receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Do you believe it? Will you accept the king while he's here? Then let's stand on our feet and just praise him with all our heart. Lord Jesus, we praise you, O great King of glory. We receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. May your people, Lord, be healed, saved, magnify your great name, Lord. Bear it, Lord. Have mercy upon your people. We are grateful for this kingdom. For by one spirit, we are all baptized. Then him is in the church. We receive a kingdom. Do you love him? Let's sing his praises. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Let's just make it ring out. Give us a card, brother. Everybody now together, let's sing it. I love him as we praise him. citizens of this kingdom. While we sing it again, let's turn around and shake hands with somebody around us and say, God bless you, my brother and sister, while we sing it all together. Shake hands, all of you, because by one spirit, we're all in one body. We're sitting with our king.
many feel just real all scoured out? Let's just, oh. Well, the word is food to our soul. Oh. Let's sing it again. Oh. 